Shalom and welcome everyone to the ICEJ webinar series. I'm David Parsons coming to you from our TV studio at the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. Thanks for being with us. The hot topic uh, this week is this threat by Iran to punish Israel for uh, the, the targeting of Ismail Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas, in Tehran a couple of weeks ago, and uh, this shadow war between Israel and Iran over the last uh, decade and a half, two decades, now a direct confrontation. And we're sitting here wondering if they're still going to attack or will they uh, wait, uh, put it off, while the uh, ceasefire and hostage talks are uh, trying to progress. Tr here to help us understand all of this, uh, our guest this week is Gadi Taub. He's an Israeli historian, an author, novelist, has also done children's books, is involved in uh, Israeli TV series and, uh, and news shows. Uh, he's a columnist for uh, the Ma'ariv and Yediot, two leading Israeli papers, used to be with Haaretz. He's written for the New York Times, the New Republic, several leading German and Italian newspapers. Uh, and, uh, and as an historian, I'm just fascinated. Good to see you, Talby. Uh, excuse me. Good to see you, Gadi. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I, I was drawn to you when you did this interview recently with Stand With Us about the fighting in Gaza, the current war, and uh, just fascinating things because you have a good grasp on Israeli history, uh, modern history of, of Israel. And uh, I think I first want to ask, um, uh, over the past 10 months of conflict, between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, and of course the the looming threat of Hezbollah, the the uh, the artillery duel on the northern border. How uh, is this for the Israeli people? The threat and what they're going through in this prolonged conflict. How does it compare to say 48, 67, 73, when Israel was also fighting existential wars? Yeah, it's it's a very good comparison, and you and you're you're mentioning the right dates. Everybody says that this war, since Israel's very existence, is now in uh, under threat. People are comparing this to the 1948 War of Independence. I've said repeatedly that it's not just like the War of Independence; it's also like another war you mentioned, 1956. Uh, people outside Israel know it as the Suez War. We call it Mivza Kadesh, the Kadesh Operation, which was a, 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 a war that Israel initiated. And, and this comparison is important to me because we, the, the war was initiated in response to something that happened the previous year when Gamal Abdel Nasser, the then dictator of Egypt, struck a very large arms deal with the Soviets called the Czech arms deal to disguise the Soviets' direct uh, involvement in this. And, he, and that completely changed the balance of power. And Israel realized that Nasser was trying also to unite the Arab world around the goal of destroying Israel and was tying a noose around us. And the, the war of 1956, which we, which we fought alongside the British and the French, much to the dismay of Dwight Eisenhower, then president of, of, the, of the United States, who believed in appeasing Nasser at that point. Unlike the current uh, administration, he learned the lesson after a short while that appeasing the most radical element is usually a bad idea, and he changed his policy. But then we did not have the backing of the Americans, and we went along on, on this war in order to strike the Egyptian army and weaken it. This was the first in a series of wars in which Israel fought against the noose that Gamal Abdel Nasser was trying to tie around our necks. So there was, you, you know, Israeli history fairly well. So you, you mentioned these wars. There, was, there, there were four wars that we fought in order to break that noose. The 56 Suez War, this, uh, the, the Six Days War in 1967, the War of Attrition between 67 and 70, and then the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And only in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, thanks to the um, political initiative of the Nixon administration, and especially 
of Henry Kissinger, uh, Egypt switched sides. So we had to break the, the, the military backbone of the noose in order to create a situation which eventually brought peace about. Now we've woken up on October 7th to a noose that Iran has been tying around our neck and people uh, don't usually like to hear it. I, I've been saying this since the beginning of the war. It has not always been welcome. And I said, this compares to 1956 and we are probably facing a long period of several wars in order to break that noose. Because that noose, David, can actually strangle us and wipe out Israel off the face of the earth, which we cannot have. So we need to understand that 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 uh, appeasement, that the, the, the noble aspiration to peace, moderation, understanding diplomatic solutions, all this is not relevant where you, when you have a, a, a terror sponsoring state with a Nazi ideology devoted to the genocide of the Jewish people. So we, we, will, have to, we will have to fight these wars and therefore, to address the, the current situation, it sounds it may sound ironic, but the worst thing that can happen now is that the Biden administration would be able to broker a ceasefire and a hostage deal that would end this war. Because if this war would end with Yihya Sinwar on his feet in Gaza, then he would emerge from a tunnel making the V Churchillian V sign. Then he would be the modern Saladin for Muslims for a thousand years to come. He would be considered the leader that had brought Israel to its knees. Our blood will remain on the water. We will have no legitimacy to fight the war that we know we have to fight against Hezbollah in the north and eventually against Iran before it has it puts its hands on, on nuclear weapons. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison to the 56 war. You don't normally name that as such a major conflict, but that's an important context for those series of wars after all the way up to Yom Kippur in 73. But that was like conventional armies facing on the battlefield and always Israel always took the, uh, the battle to the enemy territory away from its civilian heartland. But this is much different. It is rockets and armed drones now aimed at Israel's civilian heartland. And uh, we've seen a taste of it in 2006, what Hezbollah could do. We've seen different periods where Hamas, they can shut down Ben Gurion Airport. They were able to anytime they wanted. But you, you're saying Israel has to keep in on a war footing probably for years to come, to roll back this Iranian threat. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we also have to realize that we have to learn from mistakes and, and curb our own uh, un undue arrogance for many years, in which we just assume that superior technology and an open society has all the advantages and can deter all these ragtag groups of terrorists that Iran has placed on our borders, but we haven't been paying attention. And you know, when when Mike Duran and I started the our, our Israel Update podcast one week after the war started, and one of the first things we showed there was a Hezbollah video clip in which they show a little drone. You know, the the drones that have like four propellers that you can take off the shelf at Walmart, uh, dragging an RPG above a tank and then dropping it. And 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 Mike, who's a who's an analyst of foreign affairs and, and military affairs said, look what's happening. The low tech is defeating high tech because that drone at Walmart costs $90 and that RPG costs $150. And there you are with a little remote control, two people who trained for six hours can, can bring can kill an Israeli tank with an RPG from above. And the tank costs, I don't know, seven or eight million dollars, maybe the, the, the new Merkava. So what is happening is that we have not been paying attention to what some analysts now, uh, among them Mike Duran and, and John Kasapolu of the Hudson Institute said, 
we have been thinking of wars in terms of Star Wars, which is a very nice term because it's Reagan's uh, uh, system of, of, of uh, defense against uh, nuclear weapons and also a movie, as, as we all know. And so we've been thinking in terms of Star Wars, and they have defeated us in terms of what Kasapulu called Mad Max. So if you know the Mad Max movie series, this is a, a rag of desert, a, a, a band of ragtag desert um, uh, uh, terrorists mm. who, who have very primitive weapons from a boomerang to a, to a pistol and, and, and to, to a bow and arrow. And this is what is happening. David, this the, the, we need to understand that they have very smartly created a strategy in which they can defeat us with very primitive weapons. Now, what happened on the 13th of April when Iran attacked? We were all happy that we intercepted everything. But here's the real deal. It cost Israel $1.5 billion dollars to intercept a fleet of incoming drones and missiles, most of them very cheap. The Iranians, if they decide, can do this every single night for months on end. We will go completely bankrupt if we need to use this sophisticated, expensive technology for every Walmart drone that they that they uh, throw at us. And and this and this leads me to 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 what I think was 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 our greatest miscalculation is that we assumed that we can only rely on defense. And we are now waking up to the reality that we should take the initiative and think in terms of offense. And the reason that we now have a stalemate and the Iranians are considering their steps carefully is I, I would relate it to, to, uh, to two factors. One, most important, Israel demonstrated that the United States does not have the power to restrain us completely. The Iranians just assumed that the philosophy of appeasement and de-escalation and the fact that we are so dependent on a power so much larger, larger than us would suffice in order for them to be able to throw their weapons at us behind a wall of American restraint. You remember that President Biden said, after the Iranian attack, you should take the win and go home. What, what win? We, you can't win with a shield. You can't win without a sword. And, and the Iranians were just, I guess, laughing all the way to their weapons depot uh, because they thought, here, here we are, the Israeli, Israel is, is a, a, a regional uh, power of one of the strongest regional powers, perhaps, the strongest regional power. And here, America is just restraining them. And Israel demonstrated that it would not bow down to restraint. And this is the assassination that you mentioned, not yet. Israel did not take responsibility yet, but everyone is assuming that Israel was behind the taking out of Ismail Haniya of Hamas in Tehran. Then Israel defied the United States and told the Iranians, you cannot rely on the a appeasement of the uh, Americans to also include us. And secondly, uh, Hudaida, the, the port in, in Yemen, which Israel attacked, and it attacked the oil facilities. Iranian, the Iranian economy is, I think, about the size of the economy of New Jersey and much less stable, and it relies to a great extent on oil, and, and the Iranians are now thinking carefully because Israel has shed off its defensive philosophy. Note that we don't, we, we no longer talk only about how to take out their nuclear program. That is, that sounds offensive, but it is defensive. You're just attacking their weapons. Israel now has made clear that it will, it will make Iran not just its weapon programs, pay a very heavy price. And if the Iranian economy is destabilized, its corrupt, tyrannical regime would also be stabilized. And so I think, David, that this is why the mullahs are now boasting a lot, but are not that trigger happy. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I remember uh, Dennis Ross and 
Martin Endick, who, when they were with the Washington Institute uh, for Near East Policy uh, in DC years ago, and they got sort of put in charge of the Oslo peace process because they talked about how uh, the Arabs trusted the US as a mediator, an interloper between them and Israel because it, America was the only country that could restrain or pull back uh, Israel, the number of times Kissinger did it, they saved uh, Nasser and his army and, and such. But you're saying right now Israel is signaling to Iran the Americans cannot restrain us. It might be partly because the Biden administration is, is weak right now. But I, 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 I do agree there's been something in the messaging uh, back to Iran that they're already saying we will not, uh, if they strike now, it won't be like in April. We're already preempting calls by the U.S. for restraint. We're, we're saying we will not restrain ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and if I can point out, this began before the, the debate between uh, President Biden and former President Trump. So it, be, it, it began before the, uh, the, the, the sense here and in America, too, that this, uh, this, this is a lame duck president. And, and the, the, the uh, event that I want to pinpoint for that is the short Netanyahu video, which I'm sure you saw, David, in which he complained in English that the United States is uh, is withholding ammunition from Israel. That was that was the time when the American administration wanted us to refrain from invading Rafah and taking the Philadelphia corridor, which is the border between Gaza and Egypt. Very important for us to hold because this is there is a whole. A highway system underground, the Philadelphia corridor, in which Iran is smuggling weapons into Gaza. So it was crucial for us to take it. The Americans said, absolutely not. And Benjamin Netanyahu said, we have to do it and we will do it. And then he and then he, he had this uh, uh, video put online in which he actually said that the United States is withholding weapons. Now, this is you know, we, we have an expression, a military expression here called knock on roof. Um, Hakesh Bagag, you, 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 are, you, are, you live with us, so you, so you know, but maybe English speakers are not familiar with the term. It, the Israeli army, when it wants to take out a, a civilian building, first uh, signals by throwing a small bomb on the roof, which makes a lot of noise. And that's called knock on roof. And it's a sign for everyone to evacuate the building because it's a target. So I, I would say that Netanyahu made a kind of knock on roof with that video in which he said, guys, we know your game. You're over the table. You're saying how much you love us and how much you help us, but you're kicking us in the shins under the table. And when this comes to putting in danger our existential interests, then I will call you out. And he called them out on a very small thing. I thought then, and I said, and I wrote that that this was before he went to give his speech before the joint session of the two houses of Congress. I said that I'm that I'm sure, and and I haven't seen anything to disprove that that assumption that that the Biden administration is now worried that Netanyahu will come to Congress and expose their appeasement of Iran. This is this David is a policy that the American administration is concealing from its own public. The American public does not like Iran, certainly not better than it likes Israel. And, 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 and it doesn't like to know that the administration, and it wouldn't like to learn that the administration is appeasing Iran, but they've opened all, they, they basically loosened the sanctions to such an extent that the, the mullahs of Iran had enough money to light up the Middle East the Middle East was quiet until the Biden administration uh, came to power. The point in which the Iranians began to enrich uranium to a high degree was November 2020. After they were sure that Biden was elected, they assumed rightly that the United States took off the table any military threat. So Netanyahu, if I read him correctly, gave a hint, a clue, that he can make real trouble for this administration and 
and and I think that this this was a wise thing to do, not not just vis-a-vis -vis our relations with America. And don't get me wrong, these relations are crucial to our existence. I consider America a great friend, but among friends, there's disagreement. And and we need to make clear that when it comes to our existential interests, we are not the 51st state of the United States. We are mm -hmm. not under the federal government. And if there is a policy that puts out that puts us in existential mortal danger, then we will resist it. And this was read, I think, widely as a signal among our enemies and in the Arab world. And, and they understood that the game would not, we would not let anyone rig the game against us uh, when it comes to our existential interests. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, most Israelis expect the, their prime minister to guard the special relationship, strategic relationship with the U.S., but Netanyahu, probably more than any other Israeli leader, is willing to, to uh, you know, challenge uh, the U.S. on certain things because he studied there, he grew up there some, his uh, number one uh, aide is uh, um, uh, Ron Dermer, who is from Miami originally, and they they know Congress as well as as President Biden does in a way, and are willing to push the envelope a little in in standing up to what is basically the Obama era appeasement of Iran continued by Biden. Yeah. Uh, also, also, Netanyahu sees himself as you know entrusted with the safety and security of the Jewish people in our generation. He, he, he is a man with a very intense historical sense of mission. He is an intellectual. He's very well uh, read. Uh, I could send you after this talk and for your listeners too, a link to a long conversation about history, which I had with him on my Hebrew podcast. It's with, uh, with English subtitles. The man thinks, <coughs> excuse me, of himself, as you know, in every generation, a leader must carry the Jewish people across the Red Sea. And he is now in that position. And if the sea is stormy, and no matter who are enemies and who are maybe uh, mistaken friends are, his chief responsibility is to his mission, to carry the Jewish people safely to the other side of that storm. And I think he handled this very, very wisely and very moderately. I don't want to create, when I said that he challenges or that he knocked on roof, he was never rude. He never exposed the whole, uh, the whole backroom uh, skullduggery that he's been uh, subject to, but mm -hmm. he made clear that he will stand tall on Israel's, on Israel's interest. And this is what we need. This is looking historically as as we do in this conversation. Um, th this has never happened before. When when this war began, I remember several conversations on our podcast with Mike saying, "When will America put its foot down and end the war?" Because this has always been the case in all of Israel's war wars. There was a ticking clock of a American patience. When it ran out, America decisively put an end to the war. In this war, America failed to do that. And, and partly I think is because their uh, appeasing frame of mind has, uh, has led them to prolong the war by restraining Israel. So instead of supporting Israel and moving decisively to destroy Hamas, we now know that the United States tried to persuade Israel not to begin the ground operation, not to invade Gaza City, not to invade Khan Yunis, not to invade Rafah, and not to take the Philadelphia Corridor, all of which Israel eventually did. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's pressure from within Israel that, that can balance out any pressure from the outside. We have, for the first time, lost territory, David. This is this is for Israelis a great shock. I mean, we're not occupied by a foreign power, but Hezbollah has managed to cause us to evacuate the north of the country. Hamas caused us to evacuate 
the Western Negev, and we have tens of thousands of internal refugees who can't return home. Now, if you were the Israeli prime minister, how would you face tens of thousands of people if you agreed to some hostage deal and a retreat from Gaza with Yihya Sinwar still on his feet and with Hezbollah still perched on our northern border? These people would vote with their feet. They would not go home. So no Israeli leader can allow any resolution of this conflict that that acquiesces to losing territories inside our very small geography. If I mention, if I can mention New Jersey again, Israel is about the size of New Jersey. Yeah, um, this is all a very uh, interesting, fascinating picture that you're given. Uh, but Netanyahu, he, his father Ben Zion was a historian uh, like you. And, and like you say, uh, um, oh, and much, Yahoo. much more prominent than I am and much, much better. Yeah. He was a great historian. Yeah, yeah he wrote the classic uh, history of uh, the uh, Sephardi Jewry. Is, oh, you know, yeah. He's well known the, the for that. From Spain. Yeah. So I think, you know, Bibi thinks historically and the the. But, you know, he's known about the uh, nuclear genocide uh, vision that Iran has had for decades, building up these rocket threats all around what we call the ring of fire. You're calling a noose around Israel. He's been in uh, the premiership, uh, put it all together like 16 years. Why? It, it seems like October, uh, th there was this covert, this shadow war with Iran, the Stuxnet, the taking out nuclear scientists, stealing their nuclear plans. But he, Netanyahu never did a direct confrontation with Iran himself. And it seems in, in a strange way that October 7 was the wake up call that both he and the nation needed to finally start breaking out of this noose. Exactly. Wake up call is the exact right term. It also supplied internal and external legitimacy. I think that if Netanyahu tried to initiate a war with Iran, the Israeli public would have been stunned because our whole, uh, the, the whole of the brass of the IDF has been caught in that conception of uh, technological superiority and the idea that we no longer need a big army, just a small, smart army. So uh, Netanyahu, uh, probably also remembers that back in the period of uh, 2010 to 2012, he and his then Minister of Security, Ehud Barak, were contemplating a strike against Iraq, Iran's nuclear uh, program, and his own military managed to veto it, among other things, by the head of the Mossad uh, 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 snitching to the Obama administration. And and therefore and therefore uh, sabotaging the the initiative. So Netanyahu uh, has been operating within very narrow constraints. And and I think you're right that the, the this wake up call has woken up Israel and 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 those still in our military who cling to the old ideas are gradually falling on the wayside. Uh, there, was a, there was a faction of another party, the National Unity Party, Gantz, uh, Benny Gantz, former IDF chief of staff, and another former IDF chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot, who were closer to the Blinken conception of this conflict and were willing to wind it down and end it in some kind of diplomatic solution. And and they, they tried to press their point within the cabinet and failed. And when they left the cabinet in protest, you could see their polls just plummeting, just plummeting, because the, the Israeli public is very savvy. And though we suffer here from a MLAs that you can see all over the West, a progressive elite that is uh, that, that thinks in terms of appeasement that, that that thinks only in terms of individual suffering and therefore says that we can we should give up everything in order to secure the return of the hostages, Israelis in general. And ironically, the less educated they are, the 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 more common sense their common sense. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and they understand a very simple thing. We cannot let Hamas stand on its feet at the end of this conflict, no way and at no price. And so you see the spirit of young people here. And I'm telling you, I was not, not just amazed, but also deeply moved by, by their fierceness. I saw this interview with a guy who, who lost his leg in Gaza. He's a 21-year-old, and he's being interviewed in his wheelchair with his new uh, prosthetic leg. And the interviewer asked him, what do you want to do now? And he said, you see this, you see this wheelchair? I want an iron bar constructed between the handrests, and I want a machine gun on this iron bar, and I want you to send me back. And you know, this, this is a 20-year-old who just lost his leg, but not his spirit. And their slogan is, uh, the Hebrew is also awkward, so, so I'll translate it with this awkwardness in the English grammar. Not falling short of the 48th generation. And that, you know, every time I, I'm, I'm deeply moved by this because my father lost his hand in the War of Independence. And and that and that, and I know the spirit of that generation, the the, the spirit of self sacrifice, and and dedication and the deep moral commitments, and and you see this in our new generation. And we, you know, I'm a cultural critic among other things. And I thought this generation, you know, they they keep photographing their food with their phones in order to fake glamour on Instagram. And they're self-indulgent, and we are stuck here in the, this rough neighborhood with these with these hapless kids. And then this war starts, and they put their phones aside, and 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 all this this huge wave of patriotism erupted that that is just awe-inspiring. Um, I I I didn't could not imagine where if you asked me before October seven. I would not. I, I would say this society is not prepared. But you look at what's happening now. If this this war with Hezbollah is inevitable, I don't know if it will erupt now. We cannot agree to have a. This is Hezbollah is Hamas to the power of ten. It's not the same league. It's a it's a fierce organization. It has one hundred and fifty thousand rockets aimed at Israel. Some of them are precision weapons. This is not something Iron Dome can protect you from. It, Iron Dome will be quickly saturated. So we expect a, a unprecedented uh, price in, in terms of civilian life in this war. And I'm, I'm saying this with, with deep regret, but we have to fight this war if we want to survive. And so you look at the Israeli public. And people understand that this can happen. People understand that rockets can rain down on us and, and devastate many lives. Yet people are calm. Everywhere you go, you see, you see uh, calm preparations. I came home from a conference abroad. I have a cat sitter. And I find a whole bunch of water bottles in, in my apartment. My first thought is, I have a water mini bar. You, you can get clear water. From, from basically the tap. And, and then I realized people were preparing. And then I went to an electricity shop. I need to buy something for my house. And they were selling generators and lead lamps. And people are calmly in a collected way. It's like, you know, the British in the Second World War. Keep calm and carry on. People are keeping calm and carrying on. And, and we know that we may, we may be facing the greatest challenge that the state of Israel has ever faced uh, since the war of independence since its uh, creation and people i think are ready yeah i i sense it that uh after the shock of october 7 it's taken a while but the uh israeli public and all those fighting in the military they've regained their confidence ready to take the initiative uh does this mean that that uh, do you think israel should go ahead and set the pace, take the initiative to, to uh, confront Hezbollah in Lebanon and go ahead and, and uh, send uh, armored columns in to deal with the rocket threat? Well, that's a very, that's a very tricky question. Uh, I, I'd say if, if we have a scale here, I'd say that the worst solution now is if the Americans succeed, 
in brokering a hostage deal that will supply Iran and Hezbollah with a ladder uh, to climb down on from their bluster mm -hmm. uh, and then impose a ceasefire in Gaza and, uh, and in the north and finish this conflict with that our would, blood That would allow, allow Hamas to survive and, and regain control exactly. of Gaza. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the word, ironically, the worst case scenario is everything now winding down because we can't wait until they have nuclear weapons. That said, I'm not sure we should give the next punch ourselves. We should let them roast for a bit because they are now in a very difficult position that they did not expect. They, they for for almost almost the 10 months, maybe at least nine months, they were sure that they were dominating the ladder of escalation, that Israel was always only reactive. And now they that has changed. And suddenly it exposed their power for what it is. They are, they are not very strong powers. They have huge masses of this low-tech arsenal that is that they're using very smartly but they don't have an army to speak of they don't have an air force to speak of they don't have a navy to speak of so so they are they are actually vulnerable and we should not let them off the hook we i i think it's a good thing for us to show all the all our enemy enemies and our allies in this region that their knees are now trembling and 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 we have made very clear what will happen if they dare attack our civilian population. So I, I am not a trigger happy person, David, but but I think there is no way to avoid the series of wars that we need to fight in order to break this noose. We cannot just sit back and wait for the noose to, to tie around our necks. So if Iran does nothing, then we will have to consider at what point we take the initiative and attack, probably first on the northern front in Hezbollah. That's where the pressure is. That's where people can't return to their homes. But I'm not sure we should diffuse the conflict by our blow at this specific moment. And, and a direct attack on Iran, especially, uh, say, it's uh, nuclear facilities, which, which could set them back. A, a few years, but also have huge symbolic value. Yeah, and 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 that's also you know the the best thing in the world would be, of course, please understand perfectly, and their leaders understand perfectly that the United States is tired of wars in the Middle East. It does not want another Iraq. It does not want another Afghanistan, and this is why Netanyahu repeatedly said this. This Churchillian phrase, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Churchill in 1941 understood that isolationism is very strong in America, and he cannot just ask uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt to send American troops to fight Britain's war. This will not do. So he knew exactly what he was saying. This was a calculated move to say, Give us the tools. You are the arsenal of tools, but we'll do the job. And we, the, we Israelis, we'll be, uh, we'll be the boots on the ground. But it's completely different when you have, when you have uh, American backing. I interviewed, on my Hebrew podcast, I interviewed uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo just after he left office and asked him how he would define the difference between the Democrats uh, Middle Eastern policy and the Republican uh, Middle East policy. And he said our policy was had three legs. One, Iran is the problem, not the solution. That is, no, you, you don't get in a, to a, an agreement with Iran. You make Iran back off. Second, you remove the Palestinian veto. And third, you need a credible threat of force in the region. If we had those three elements now, uh, a United States that is that is not that is not creating uh, is not using the Palestinian issue in order to drive a wedge inside the anti-Iranian coalition and a credible threat in the region, then then the United States would not have to ever put boots on the ground. It would be enough to have them looking over our shoulder and supplying us with 
the means and the finance in order to fight this war because david you know this is this is not an egotistic thing you know that the jewish people is just taking care of its uh, of its own private yard we as as general the british general richard kemp said the west is in a war with iran and only israel is fighting it that is that is the plain truth iran is not just out to destroy israel and 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 uh, and kill all Jews. It's also an enemy of the West, and it says so. It's a very smart and subversive uh, uh, enemy. It is the sponsor of terror all over the West, and the West is just keeping its eyes shut and thinking that it can that it can appease uh, that it can appease the the radical Muslims. A, a just now a, a a man was was arrested in the UK for saying something bad about the prophet muhammad or about uh, allah and 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 you look at this and you say are blasphemy laws back on the books in order to do what in order to find favor with people who are openly calling to the destruction of your countries of your values of your religion of your people and and we are trying to bend backwards in order to not offend them is 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 that really where we are because this is this is a like an autoimmune disease we the, the the barbarians are using our own values against us and mm. and we should not let them do it uh, my friend uh, professor dan shiftan has argued rightly i think that this is a test case all these self-righteous Europeans uh, cooperating with radical Muslims in the Hague, all these people who are tolerant of pro-Hamas uh, demonstration in American campuses. I just saw that it took a federal judge in UCLA in order to decide that it is illegal to prevent Jewish students from getting into the library. That we Do we need a judge for that now? Is that not self-evident? So, so that says, the West is is caught up in the, in the midst of an autoimmune disease, and Israel Israel's task now is to show that despite all these forces, despite the self righteous accusations against Israel of genocide at the International Court of Justice at the Hague, despite all this, we will move forward because it is up to us to show that civilized nations can free their hands to triumph over barbarians and we will not tie our own hands and have them kill us wow this is an important message for our day and i know there are a lot of christians out there who uh who agree with this and and this is what netanyahu said in his speech in in uh, washington in front of congress that it's civilization against barbarianism exactly. um there are some analysts who uh, we'll, we'll try and wrap up with this there are some analysts who say that Iran really can't hurt Israel right now. We saw what happened in April, that 99% of them were intercepted, uh, that the big threat is Hezbollah. But you, you mentioned a while ago that Iran has enough of these cheap ballistic missiles and all to fire to really uh, 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 treat uh, Israel's defenses. But our, my question is, are Israelis intimidated by the Iranian threat and even the Iranian nuclear threat. I don't sense any real panic uh, about it, uh, but but the, Israel needs good leadership in this moment to deal with it. But I, I think Israelis are not uh, panicking over this. I, I think you're right. There's concern, but not panic. And, and, and the sense of um, practical urgency we 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 are we understand that we need to do things and if you go to a shiva which is you, you know the jewish uh, form of mourning where you sit seven days and mourn your your dead if you go to a shiva of people who who just lost sons and daughters kids 19 year olds in this conflict you see that determination so the people understand the gravity of the situation and i i had the privilege of interviewing this this amazing uh, woman called Galit Waldman, her her son, uh, 
uh, I, I don't know what the, the 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 American ranks the parallels are. It's one rank over captain, um, in a special unit who lost his life on October seven, and she had, and she was interviewed and 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 say and and asked by the interviewer some you know progressive woman in uh, on mainstream media she said you know now that you're a bereaved parent you can you can refuse the sign for your other sons to go to combat units in order to make sure they will they will not die and she said that doesn't even cross my mind this mm -hmm. is our moment as a people she said we have to rise up to the challenge and i raised my children to be soldiers now that's that's you, you know you you what uh, this is a woman you think you know uh, you would meet in in the supermarket this is nothing t tell tellingly heroic about her and she had just lost her son three weeks before the interview she lost her son and she's sitting there and the interview asked her i understand i will not see you cry and she said no way and asked her, what would I see? A woman who lost her son. And she said, you will see a proud mother. And that's, you know, that's that's amazing. So that's the spirit of, of the people here now. And, and, and this is what the basis for my optimism about our chances of, of, of winning this conflict. These are the people we we have and and these are people who would give everything for this fight and and power to them yeah i think uh you know western uh the western world uh owes israel apologies and and a lot of respect and commendation for for the way you're standing up to this thread if we want to sum up our friend here Ga uh, gadi taub has said israel uh, is on a war footing, uh, uh, shocked uh, out of uh, a complacency uh, by October 7, and it needs to stay on that war footing in order to cut the ring, the noose uh, around it that Iran has tried to, many say it's an octopus with tentacles, uh, and he says Israel needs to stay on that war footing. It may take a few years, there may be breaks in the, in the war, but they have to to uh, destroy this uh, threat that Iran uh, has placed around as an as a existential threat. Anything else you want to share? No, it's a it's a pleasure to to be here, and I'm always touched by the interfaith camaraderie and and deep uh, and deep commitment. So yeah. we we know we have friends in the Christian community. These are not the 1930s, and and we have people to rely on. And and it's always great, David, to be reminded of that. So thank you. Well, good. We hope we're an encouragement and comfort to you and the people of Israel. It's been very enlightening and very encouraging to uh, to hear you today, Gaudi. The the sober uh, thinking that that Israelis are going through, and really gallant. I mean, you're talking about this mother there at the end. Uh, uh, we just have to respect this. Uh, we thank you for your time, Gadi uh, Taub, an Israeli historian, and he has the Israel Update podcast with Dr. Dr. Michael uh, Duran of uh, the Hudson Institute. Thank you for your time.